Uh, good morning. <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, Sunday Hokioji Sunday Morning Dharma Talk. It's my pleasure today to welcome Reverend Jeremy Cadel Thotland. He's been practicing at MZMC since 2014, as was ordained by Ted O'Toole in 2019. <clears throat> His focus is on experimental practice, living Zen off the cushion, and living a service-oriented life. He finds Zen practice fulfilling and difficult and totally worth it. He's happy to share his experience with others. He grew up and currently lives in Minneapolis with his partner, Andrea, uh, dog, Juniper, and cat, Turk. So um, thank you so much for... Um, joining us today, uh, Cato, and we look forward to uh, hearing what you have to say. Thank you so much. Oh, I don't have my video on, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dokai, <clears throat> and thank you everyone for uh, having me here. Yeah, um, I'm gonna have to update my bio a little bit. Uh, my dog had passed away a few, few weeks oh, ago. A few weeks ago? Yeah, oh. so I definitely need to update that. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a sad point in life, but it's also a good reminder of the connections that we have. Um, so today, yeah, I do. I do want to talk a little bit about. Uh, my experience in life and my experience of how I am incorporating what I experience with what I uh, know and learn about Zen and how this life uh, doesn't, it, it weaves together and doesn't come apart from what, uh, what I think Zen is. So recently, um, I was spending some time in the hospital with my mom. My mom is uh, not in the best of health and, and she spends uh, a bit of time in the hospital. And we were in the ER in this particular instance. And um, I'd been there for a couple hours and we were in and out seeing some nurses and she was getting some tests run and things like that. <clears throat> And at one point, there was just kind of this stillness that settled in the room. I'm sitting there, just wishing that we would get some test results or wishing that we would get uh, some kind of word from the doctor. Are we, are we gonna stay overnight? Are we going home? Is something wrong? We, we don't know and none, nobody, none of the nurses could say anything. But in this moment, in that particular moment, my mom is just reading a book. She's not doing much of anything. She's reading a book. And I was sitting there just checking in with what's going on with me. And what I noticed was I was spending a lot of my effort wishing something would be different. I, was, I really felt this pressure inside, this pushing, wanting something to happen, wanting, like I said, results, wanting word, wanting some something other than what we were getting. And then my, as I'm sitting there, just kind of feeling these things, I'm also listening and I'm also kind of taking in a, a wider picture of what's going on in the ER from my little vantage point. And what I notice is that the nurses are coming and going. Um, I know the doctors are over at their station or, or with patients. And there's, there's actually quite a lot going on 
you know, I'm, I'm, I want something to happen and darn it, things are happening. And not because of what I want, just because of the natural order of things. And I know that somewhere, um, these, these test results or these whatever images are, are whizzing through some, some, uh, network lines and going to computers and waiting for people to read them. It's not what I want to happen, but it is what's actually happening. And so there's a lot of uh, doing, there's a lot of effort that is happening. And this kind of, I've had some experiences lately like this that um, have led me to want to explore and talk about effort in a way that uh, kind of makes sense to my body and makes sense to uh, my experience. And we can turn to some things uh, some ideas around Zen to kind of inform us of that. Uh, we have things uh, in the Eightfold Path of right effort or beneficial effort. Um, there's a saying of uh, <clears throat> the effort of no effort. And what the heck does that mean? So when when is it uh, that we need to make an effort and when is it that we can let things go and let things happen and let things be doing nothing at all and and when is doing nothing actually nothing I've been kind of struggling with this because as a as a person myself I'm a I'm kind of a hands-off kind of person um, I had my time in life when I was, you know, wanted my fingers and everything and I wanted to uh, make things happen and be an influencer and um, control what was happening around me at least, or at least in my, in my life and my purview. So I don't know what happened in my life where I took a step back and now when something's going on, I don't want to touch it. I got it set up. It's all set up the way I like it. Don't move. Don't do anything. Don't know, please. And I really see this when um, when somebody that doesn't have that mindset enters and, and tries to do something and I feel this uh, this pushing again, this uh, large internal effort uh, to really make things stay the way they are. Just totally not within the practice of Zen where we, uh, we know that there's constant change and we know that things don't stay the same. And yet I still struggle with, uh, it's not complacency, it's just uh, maybe it's a bit of disengagement I have created a habit of disengagement or a habit of uh, not making uh, an external effort to uh, form things, to help things, to uh, make a situation. And I have a good friend that uh, has a lot of that habit energy to <clears throat> change the things that are there. And so we talk about it and he talks about how he <clears throat> would like to do less. And I talk about how I would like to do more. And it leads me again to this effort what is what is effort and I have a uh, an idea in my body of what effort is 
and I would I would like to explain what that is, but um, I'm not very good at explaining my internal uh, life yet. I'm still working on that. Um, but I did come up with uh, something of an activity that, <clears throat> if you'd be so kind to take part in, might explain a little bit of what I'm feeling in my body. Excuse me. <coughs> what I mean by this kind of pushing, maybe you already know, this pushing effort versus um, kind of a, an active effort versus this passive effort or this effort of no effort, which is kind of where I'm trying to get to. Uh, so if you'll humor me for a minute, um, this is an activity where we want to have uh, a good idea of what our body is doing and feeling. So if we're uh, on the on the floor, if we're in a chair, if we're standing, we can do this in whatever position we're in, if we're laying down. Um, and what I'd like you to do is what we're in whatever position you're in, there is a, you know, maybe a table or the floor or the bed or the chair that you can lay your hands on and uh, really just start holding whatever that is down. Hold it down, make a little effort, you know, engage that core a little bit and make an effort to hold the table down or hold the floor down. And kind of there's this, mm, there's this pushing this. And I mean, like, let's hold that thing down. It's going to come up if we don't, if we don't make this effort. And recognize what is going on in the body. What feelings are there? What uh, sensations? There's some pressure in the hands, maybe, or in the feet. There's uh, some tightening in the in the core area, maybe there's a, a hunching in the shoulders. And then let that ease up and keep in contact with whatever it was you were holding down. And still maintaining that contact, if you can experience the release of the pressure. and still hold whatever it is, the table, the floor, the chair in its position. And the ease of the body when that happens, recognizing the shift in the feeling. Notice that the floor, the table really isn't being held down by us at all. Okay, you can relax and return. Thank you. Um, our lives are like this. I think the whole universe is like this. This reminds me of Newton's third law. Uh, and it says when there's two objects and they apply force to each other, those forces are exactly the same. When we walk, when we take a step, the force that we put on the floor, on the earth, is exactly met, precisely met, by the force of the earth holding us up. So whether we make great effort or whether we make passive effort, the moment meets us with this same thing.
I recently was able to take a trip to Japan for uh, Keizan Zenji's 700th memorial celebration. And it was a, a tour that the Soto Zen North America put on for um, Western priests. And we got to, uh, we got to tour, we met in, in Fukui prefecture and we got to tour Eiheiji. And then uh, we got to tour and spend some time in Sojiji, which is Keizan's temple in uh, near Tokyo. And at one point, this was just, there's lots of phenomenal things about this and there's lots of mundane things about this. And it's, this isn't a travel log. And so I'm just gonna skip straight to the point that um, at some point I recognized how hard everybody was working. I was, I saw uh, Western priests trying really, really hard to be good Zen priests and good Zen students and trying hard to uh, <clears throat> show the Japanese that we, we know what we're doing. We know how to do it. And I saw the Japanese priests trying really, really hard to show us Westerners that they're, they're Japanese priests, they're real Zen priests and they really know what they're doing. And my heart just got really big. And I thought, oh, look at us. What are we doing? Why are we making all this effort to try to uh, do something that's already happening? To try to show somebody else that we are legit. When we were in Aheji, uh, we got a lecture from the priest that trains the new monks. And we got a lecture on how to do Zazen. <laughs> and I thought, why am I getting a lecture on how to do Zazen? And then this guy that's next to me that's been practicing for more than my life, 50, 60, 70 years. I don't know how old he was. He seemed pretty old. getting lectured on how to do Zazen. And I was, uh, I was kind of insulted. I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed by my reaction of being insulted. And then I thought, what else are we gonna be taught when we're sitting in Aheji, Dogen's temple uh, about Zazen? I mean, that's the primary thing. That's what we're doing, right? He wrote about that quite a bit. But it still felt like, okay, we're going to show the, the Western priests that this is how it's done. And there needs to be active effort in a lot of ways. We need to come to practice and we have greatly accumulated karma that is a hindrance to our practice. And so we need to make real effort, real pushing, real striving effort to uh, overcome some of that sometimes so that we can sit so that we can reflect, so that we can engage in the moment over and over again. And in Japan, there needed to be a real effort to organize such a complicated trip with a hundred Westerners coming over and buses and trains and logistics and all of us in our little groups and when we're gonna get up and how we're gonna make our beds. and Many details that we deal with in life 
that we need to make our effort for. But how much do we make our effort? How much do we push and strive when we don't need to, to prove ourselves in a way that we don't need to? Another experience that I had recently that really emphasized this point was I was leading a retreat with a young Sangha up in Bemidji. And by young, um, I was the old man of the group. And uh, I don't think anybody was over 30. Um, and it's a very new place. This was their first session that they had ever done in that place. And I saw everybody trying very, very hard. I saw people with chronic pain sitting, trying to be still. Um, people with, with other trauma, people that were in, in active conflict sitting next to each other, trying to be still. Um, the Tenzo working in the kitchen with their assistant turning out fabulous meals, um, trying so very hard. Everybody wanting to make sure that everything was just right, that everything was correct and they're doing things in the right way. And some of that effort really needs to be made. Without the effort of the Tenzo, we probably wouldn't eat. But how much of the effort was maybe to prove that they knew what they were doing, maybe to prove their worthiness. And this, um, I think, might be misdirected. And this pushing to try to be something else doesn't need to happen. When we meet the moment and we meet it with ease, we can see that the effort that we put in is met with the effort of the moment. And there's nothing else that's needed there. In the Fukan Zazengi, uh, Dogen states that the way is originally perfect and all pervading. And he says, what need is there for our concentrated effort? Thusness is already as it is. And we don't have to effort to make anything happen other than what's happening. So why do we need to make any effort at all? And what effort is it that we're making? So some of the effort uh, that we need to make, as I said before, is overcoming karma or it more, more along my, uh, my experience is making mistakes. Um, you might be able to see a little bit up here, uh, my my altar and the thing over my altar. For New Year's in our tea group, we get to uh, make a little wish or a little statement for the year. <clears throat> and uh, one of the Japanese men teaches us the kanji and how to write it. And I wanted to just put mistake on it. Like, I need to work with mistakes. I make a lot of them. I don't, I'm afraid of making mistakes. I need to be comfortable with mistakes. And they're like, no, you can't just put mistake on there. That's not good. That's not good luck or something. I don't know. They, they were just really, really, really resistant about it. And I'm like, no, really. I, I really need to be more comfortable putting myself out there and making mistakes. 
And so we went back and forth a little while. And uh, he came up with the, the Japanese phrase, uh, shipe watane, which uh, I came to learn is kind of a, a farmer's phrase of when they plant a field and something that they didn't plant grows. And it might be a crop from last year. And I see this in the fields here in Minnesota, mostly the soybean fields, because it's a nice low crop. And then you got that one sprout of corn that sprouts up over here. You got that one mistake, that one, one mistake with that one seed that grew, that didn't grow last year, that now grows this year. Shipe is mistake and Tane is seed. So mistakes are seeds. And as, as a limited being, I can't help but make the mistakes as uh, as a practitioner of Zen, I can't help but know that what I experience and what I see is not the entire thing of what it is. There's a, talking point around um, seeing a coil of rope on the ground as a snake. And all my life, I thought this coil of rope was a snake. And so everything that I've done in my life is to uh, deal with this snake that I see here. So at some point I realize my mistake that this snake is not indeed a snake, but a coil of rope. And everything that I've done has been a mistake. Or has it? Has all my effort that I've come to taught me to see the coil of rope? Jury's out on that one. So this idea of the effort of no effort or beneficial effort also uh, brings up in me this idea of what home can be. In a very literal sense, Home is a building. Could be uh, considered not where I'm going with this. The building, the external stuff. This room or home, in order for me to uh, be at home, I need this uh, sense of safety. And I need uh, some kind of protection or some kind of shell. I need conditions around me to be just right in order to feel a sense of belonging. But home is also this place where effort comes from. This effort of no effort comes from this sense of belonging in home that is always just right here. This thing that never leaves us. Shirtau says the vast inconceivable source can't be faced or turned away from. That is the home that I'm talking about. That is the home of no effort. That is the home of beneficial effort. It's as close as, to us as our shadow or our eyelashes. Hakuin talks about the, the sea of energy or the, the cinnabar field 
And he talks about it as, as a real place in our body. Our midsection, our, uh, our legs, the arches of our feet. He says, it's all the home and native place of original being. What news or tidings could come from that native place? And in light of this talk, what effort can come from that native place? This original being, the source. This is the flow of life to me. The life that is here, the life that is there, the life that's, that just is. And it flows around and it seems to me uh, like a circle that just flows. There's a flowing circle. That there's no inside or outside, but that we're all in that circle. We're all a part of that. Going back to Dogen, what need is there for our concentrated effort? Mistakes, yes. Confusion, yes. So one of the ways that I, I use to keep coming back to make beneficial effort and to make sometimes no effort is vow. In vow, I keep coming back to what it is that I'm doing, what it is that is here. My vow is the direction that I want to go. And when I make a mistake and veer off this way, when I get confused and forget which direction I'm going, there's always that vow there that's my compass that can move me back into the right direction. And it's not something that I'm trying to get to. Uh, it's not an end point. It's not a final destination, my vow. My vow is there just to guide me to keep coming back, to keep aligning myself, to keep making the effort to go in the right direction. Vow can help us with that. It can help us in doing that and maintaining moment to moment effort forever. And the other thing that we have, of course, is Zazen. Zazen to me seems uh, the like the pinnacle of <laughs> the effort of no effort. Sitting in Shikantaza and letting whatever arises arise. Letting whatever happens, happens. We drop off this doing energy, this pushing energy, this effort that we try to make. And we just sit And it comes up and it goes, and it comes up and it goes. We get out of the way. We let the doing that's happening just happen. And to me, this is, uh, like I said, the pinnacle, the, the uh, very essence of effortless effort. It doesn't mean that uh, during that effortless effort that I'm not confused or that I still uh, follow my thoughts and let my mind wander, but I come back to it. I come back to vow. I come back to just this. And I sit and I make my effort just to come back. And it's as easy as not holding up the floor or holding down the floor or the table. 
It's as easy as the earth meeting your foot as you step around. It's as easy as the moment that comes and goes. And I think that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, I think uh, you've brought up a lot of very uh, provocative points. I got up to leave to see if I could find my uh, Suzuki Roshi book, Beginning Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, and I can't imagine you're not aware. I was I wanted to quote it precisely, but uh, I can't I can't find the book at my fingertips. It's uh, he says. Someone asks him, what, or, what is Zazen, something like that, or what is life practice? And he just says, one continuous mistake. So, mm. <laughs> so I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So, Yeah, trying to embrace that is hard, though. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm kind of thinking if it's just all continuous, it's kind of a, a relief. <laughs> because it never <laughs> stops and so there's not, there's not a time when you're actually making a mistake or not making a mistake but can you because you're continuously making a mistake so mm -hmm. uh, it's just one one big continuous one huh yeah one big you know right from the beginning to the end just one <laughs> big mistake <laughs> I never thought of it that way. That sounds yeah, no, I think it's kind of liberating. You know, it's like, okay, it was a mistake that I'm born, it's a mistake I'm gonna die, but it's just a mistake to even think about it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it it gives me a little um relief sometimes. I'll just throw in one other comment. Um <clears throat> I mean there's lots of things I could um uh, comment on, um, as you all know, I'm approaching uh, this time that I've kind of set out as a, a time for me to step back, uh, retire from Hokyoji. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, how do you handle that? I mean, there's a, there's a, there is a reason why people used to retire, you know, when, when they're like 62 years old. There's a reason from their job, you know. It's like you just can't keep pushing to make things the way you want them to be. And it's time to kind of just step back. That's how I, I kind of view uh, retirement. Um, but I don't have to <clears throat> push things the way I want them to be. Um, so <clears throat> I kind of had the, uh, the uh, I did study physics. I mean, like, uh, you know, physics for scientists uh, with calculus and everything for a couple of semesters. And, and we, you know, of course, we went into Newton's laws. And uh, even when I was <clears throat> 45 years old, I found it so counterintuitive, you know, that, you, you know, I'm standing on the floor and exerting a certain force down on the floor, and the floor is exerting a, the exact same force up toward me. I said, are you kidding me? This is nuts. This, is, <laughs> this doesn't make any sense at all. But, you know, when you work out the math, you know, you can do some amazing uh, calculations with that. And, uh, you know, little by little, you, you say, yeah, that's, it's true. It's true. You know, there's, there's that dynamic going on that we don't, you know, it's, it's, it's counterintuitive, I would say. But it's also <clears throat> kind of astounding to me that a person living in the 1700s could discover that so mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, anyway the, but the, the whole point is that's kind of like an analogy for me how do you exert your force well it's 
completely the same as walking on the ground. <laughs> you know, the ground's pushing up, you're pushing down. So it's just, you, you meet all these conditions and circumstances and just meet them with the same kind of force where they're coming towards mm -hmm. or whatever, you know. Maybe it's a strong force of which you have to uh, respond with a gentle force. I don't know. But it's kind of like a, just a constant um, something in motion. You know, mm -hmm. that's what very that, dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. It's just dynamic all the time. And, and so that's that. I mean, there's other things too that you brought up kind of active, passive, and uh, the, the whole Japanese experience with Westerners. I could tell a few stories about that, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, inhibit myself and give uh, other people a chance to speak. So. Mary, did you have something? <clears throat> Sorry, I kind of put my hand up there and uh, didn't mean to interrupt a dokai. Um, <clears throat> um, and thank you both. Wow. I mean, so many things came up for me, Jeremy, when um, I still call you Jeremy because right. we're on our little committees together. That's right. So uh, with affection, Jeremy. Um, and, and Dokai as well. So um, this month I'm I'm in a um, I, I'm I'm doing a um, meta um, Zoom. Um, meditation practice um every day trying to go every day with a with whoever shows up on zoom so um and there's usually about 20 of us anyway and it's led um actually it's toku uh, cynthia scott yeah. is leading it any anyway and a couple things of uh, what you had said today jeremy kind of it just kind of, um, I, I had had a visceral reaction to. Uh, first of all, the kind of towards the end of your um, Dharma talk, the, the idea of this, all these global issues that we all deal with, the idea of, um, of mistakes and living by vow and Ah, you know, how we are in the world. And um, it, it's sometimes I can get lost in, you know, what Buddhism is for me globally in, in my life. Um, and it can be very anxiety producing, actually, um, as I kind of struggle with the sort of the global notion of, of, Buddhism and sometimes overwhelmed by it because it's so great. <laughs> I don't know another word, but um, I can't, I get lost then. Uh, you personally, m my uh, issue in my life is that um, I'm always ahead of myself. So when you, in this meta practice, one of the things that comes up is being in your body, your front body and your back body. And what I know about myself is that I'm always leading with my front body. I'm always, I'm always in front of myself. And so it's, it's been a very um, kind of profound aha for me to, to actually rest in that, to, to understand that about myself. Because I'm, I'm, I'm never, I'm rarely in my back body. Mm -hmm. When I am, everything changes for me in my state of mind. Um, so I have to actually think about that and accept that. Um, that when I sit down to, to do any kind of meditation, the first thing for me, you know, my tendency is, well, I got to change my breathing here. You know, my breathing needs to change. It's too fast. I'm, you know, I'm coming in. I've got, you know, I'm kind of anxious and whatever. And by God, 
got to change. And I had to change this within a minute because I only got 30 minutes here and right you know, now, change. Yeah. Um, rather than just accepting that um, no need to change anything about my breathing and to accept that. Mm -hmm. That is my practice. And then the last thing I'm going to say, well, two things. One is, for me, understanding the generosity of gravity. Because for me, because I live in the front of my body, and always wanting to kind of, you know, go forward, live, live in the front of the body. I don't, I don't think, I don't think of thinking gravity and the generosity that gravity has given me in my life <laughs> and mm -hmm. is trying. Mm -hmm. Generosity is, I mean, gravity is just trying, trying, trying over and over <laughs> mm -hmm. to keep me grounded. And that's not my tendency. And the last thing is to forgive myself for these tendencies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's something I gotta keep reminding, keep telling myself and trying to practice is actual true forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's where I'm going with the, my mistakes too, is the the forgiveness part of that. That there's nothing that needs to change and nothing that really needs to happen about that. Thank you. And accepting, yeah. This this whole thing about effort is something that <clears throat> it's a lifelong <laughs> yeah. it's a lifelong uh, paradox. So there's a lot of things I could say. One one thing that's helped me a lot is um, John Dunn through um, Upaya um, has this little series of questions he asks. He asks, um, "Are you conscious?" And of course, everybody just says yes. And then says, how do you know that you're conscious? And it's like, oh, I just know that I'm conscious. Well, is there any effort in knowing that you're conscious? And it says, well, can you increase that effort of knowing that you're conscious? Well, that's kind of a trick question. But it's like this: there's this effortless effort of just being conscious. And... Um, in the history of software, when we when we would try to do something new and we read read about it in a book, and and try to implement that design pattern or whatever, um, if it just worked the first time, in six months, if something came up in that area, you would you wouldn't have any idea, what you would have to study the whole thing again. But if you struggled with it and made a lot of mistakes in implementing it, then six months later when that came up and it needed to be maintained or enhanced in some way, it was like, oh yeah, I remember this. Mm -hmm. So is it like these mistakes are really um, beneficial in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And I, I, would, I would say um, this whole idea of karma, karma is not a hindrance, karma is, is just is. Kategori Roshi said, it's it's not good or bad, it just is. Mm. And it's who you are. And so there's this, this thing about, you know, just dealing with who you are. So I remember being at, at Hokioji when uh, Jim and Victoria came to visit Dokai. And we were in the, we were in the residence and sitting around a table. And Victoria told this story about she was asked to serve and uh she went to Kategori Roshi and said she was just she was very nervous about about serving because she didn't think she could do it right, and maybe somebody else should be um, 
assigned to be a server because she, she was concerned that she wouldn't do it right. And, and Roshi said, uh, oh, sounds like a lot of ego. <laughs> so the greatest effort we make all the time is maintaining projecting yes. who we are. Yes. And you get to a certain point, like retirement, when, okay, that doesn't matter so much. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, can, I can just be, I don't have to worry about projecting if I'm smart, if I'm clever, if I'm funny, if I'm stupid, if whatever. Mm -hmm. It's just, there's a way to just move. So I, I would offer that. So Thanks, thank you for your talk. Hi, uh, yeah. <clears throat> Thanks for the thanks for the talk, Kato Jeremy, and um, all these uh, comments have been um, quite wonderful this morning. I think I was um, primed in a way to uh, to actually hear this, uh, and that um, that feels really good uh, in my body. Although it also feels a little um, shaky. Like one of my tendencies is to uh, instead of push, is to pull. You know, particularly with effort. It's like uh, putting things between me and like that, that deep, um, that well, you know, um, it's, it's a, it's a buffer, but it's also like that, that energy. It, I think it's the same energy of contraction, just, um, uh, materializing in a different way. And, um, yeah, yeah. And it all has to like down at the very bottom of that, um, is a reflection of, of worth and uh, worthiness. And so effort comes through uh, as a way to, um, to fill that instead of really um, filling that here. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think, um, I think that softening um, and letting go of that contraction and uh and letting that force from the earth uh be there as well and, and trying to feel feel that and feel that um that makes a lot of sense to me so uh thank you yeah you, you can't see on my altar here i got a little teeny tiny buddha touching the earth when mara says what right have you who attests to your worthiness and the earth says, me, all beings, everywhere. We don't have to do a darn thing. We're all right. I turn to that for, that's kind of my refuge sometimes. A reminder uh, when I forget that you know, my feet are on the ground. My butt is on the cushion. I am, I'm all that I need to be right now. Erin. Yeah, I also just thank you for that. Brought up just a, a lot of things to kind of chew on, which I always appreciate and I won't try to say all of them, <laughs> but but one thing is more maybe a question. Um, uh, when you mentioned the, being taught zazen at Sojiji, it brought up a little memory that it's kind of stuck with me for a long time. And then later, you mentioned oh my tea group, and I was like oh there it is because I I I, I don't I only know just a tiny tiny bit of tea like did just a little bit of reading and would love to know more. But the thing that's stuck with me there's a point at which and I don't and I don't think this is a question because maybe you know because um there's a point at which maybe it has to do with the the year of tea or a certain occasion or or something where even the masters the tea masters go 
go back to the very, very beginning, like learn just the real basics from the bottom up. And, um, and it seemed to be that was a thing that had been put into like it was part of the practice to do that and it's like I say it's kind of stuck with me for a while like oh that's interesting I wonder like what 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 that's about and I don't know if you've kind of, just in your experience with tea practice have come across that or I, I wish I could remember where I read it or or, or something but yeah just... I haven't come across it as a calendar thing like every year we do that um but but Riku the uh, kind of the originator of the school, the founder of the school of tea that I follow. He, much like uh, Zen, is, you know, beginner's mind. You go back to the basics, boil water, make tea, drink the tea. That's, of all the, of all the things that we're doing, that's the basic thing that we're doing. And you need to go back to that. When it comes down to it, we have a procedure for this thing. We got a procedure for laying charcoal, but in the end, you need to lay the charcoal in a way that heats the water, right? That's what the charcoal is for, is to heat the water. And we need to have hot water to make tea. So just, you, you do what you need to do. You go back to the basics. And I think, yeah, that really connected with being at a Heiji and being lectured about Zazen. Um, yeah, of course, what, what else are we gonna do? But go back to the basics. Beginner's mind kind of thing. I wish I could speak more about your tea question. <laughs> As an early no. student, I, I still consider myself an early student, even though I've been doing it for some years. But uh, yeah, I, I just don't know the the ins and outs well enough. Thank you. And thank you again for your talk. That was thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Well, I think we're approaching the end of our time here. I, uh, I there's a, a lot of things I you brought up for me, Jeremy, like waiting in the hospital room or the waiting room what a torturous experience no matter no matter what uh, situation you're in just mm -hmm. talking about being totally out of control so uh, but anyway that's uh, part of it mary i <clears throat> i'm not sure i view gravity as generous <laughs> I, a, t a little anecdote i was about uh, maybe in the middle of last week, I, I just went to the high shop and I had uh, some breakfast by myself. It was, it was like, I didn't invite anyone from Okioji along, just felt like having a breakfast there. But I overheard this conversation at another table where someone, uh, I think an elderly woman had fallen four feet off something. And, and all I could think of is Carl. That's yeah. how fall he, how far he fell, and and the damage that happened to his body and whatever happened to this woman it was worse. Uh, I don't know all the details, but I just thought I could just tell. Oh man, something really bad happened to her, and um, it just has no forgiveness. <laughs> gravity uh it's just a force that's right there but maybe that's good maybe that's good um we need we need a force like that um <clears throat> yeah well, i'll stop there <laughs> you, you all brought up uh, lots of stuff for me I had a brief stint as a software engineer, software programmer. My problem is right from the beginning, I could not get one single pro program to work. So, <laughs> so, so uh, Jushin, was, Jushin was saying, uh, oh, if it works right away, you know, you, you don't really learn about the program. But I tried learning about this program from the inside out, and I could not figure out. And eventually the boss said, you know, Ron, I gave you the simplest 
thing to do. <laughs> and you can't figure this out. And I thought, well, I wonder what that means exactly. <laughs> so my tenure as a software engineer ended quite abruptly. Okay, other than that, I think it's time to move on. <clears throat> So uh, the events happening is that um, next week's speaker on Sunday is GD, and one after that is Aaron, who is Reverend Aaron uh, Davis, who is right here with us today. So I think we all know who Aaron is, so I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. So anyway, <clears throat> okay. Um, so uh, another retreat begins here on the 19th of this month, uh, practicing the way in this very moment led by GD, and the conclusion of that retreat will be next Dar uh, Sunday's Dharma talk, her final talk for that uh, retreat. Um, then after that, oh yeah, then after that is Aaron. And then in July, um, for a week, uh, Clouds and Water will be visiting us. And also, one of their talks will be, during their retreat, will be uh, our Sunday morning talk as well by um, Tizen. Tizen. Um, Tizen. Um, Alfred. Al Alfred. Alfred. Alfred, yeah. Um, and then uh, moving in, well, then later in July, July 26th, the family weekend. And I'll keep going on 7.31, uh, Clouds and Water Retreat with Fish Murphy. And then August 10th is the Jewel Mirror Session. So that's what's coming up this summer. And with that in mind, let us do the four vowels. <clears throat> okay. Beans are numberless, I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible, I vow to end them. Dharma gates are boundless, I vow to enter them. The Buddha way is unsurpassable, I vow to realize it. Thank you again, Jeremy, so much for your willingness to share. We appreciate it. Thank you all for coming and hopefully see you all again soon. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>